Shauna Spraker. I'm with the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives. And we always like to do something every month for history, but we thought this, this month we need to do something to celebrate the archives. So we're going to share our map collections with you today, which also coincides nicely with the fact that the Digital Library of Georgia um, just finished up a grant with us to digitize over 400 of our maps. So we'll also show you a little bit of um, what we did with them this year to digitize and provide greater public access to our maps. So today is Map Surveys and Plans, oh my. So little twist on uh, The Wizard of Oz. And we may have a little stragglers coming in, but, um, and also, we're gonna split our session today. We're gonna start in here with a presentation, and then we're gonna go across the hall about halfway through to do some hands-on show and tell with materials laid out. And I've got Lacey, will you raise your hand? And then Kelly um, also will step in. And about midway, they're gonna s transition over. So if I start running over late here and you feel like you need to get over there to see the hands-on material because you need to get back to work, you will not hurt my feelings to slip across the hall to go with them to start the hands-on part um, so you can be on your merry way, okay? All right, so this is just a brief agenda. We're gonna start with some fun um, stories about some of our um, survey and engineers that we've identified that have some really interesting backstories. Then I'm gonna give you a really brief introduction to the archives and collections, and then tell you how you can start your access and discovery of those collections, because that actually starts at home or in the office on your computer um, to start your discovery, and then the hands-on discovery part. And then Kelly just walked in. Kelly, raise your hand so they all know who you are. So they're gonna help us across the hall. Okay, so it all starts with the creation of the city surveyor's office. And that started in May of 1799 with the passage of this ordinance for, the pre for preventing disputes about boundary within the corporate limits of the city and for other purposes. And the general purpose of the ordinance was to prevent encroachments on public property, things like our public squares, our streets, our lanes, our docks, and the city common. Um, and also to prevent controversies between our lot holders and the occupiers of those lots. So that was the main purpose of that ordinance. That ordinance also created the position of city surveyor. Um, and some of the other things that were important in that ordinance, it said you could not build a fence or a foundation without having your lot lines confirmed by the city surveyor. And it outlined the fees the city surveyor could charge for things like placing stakes, surveying lots, being in attendance and directing the placement of those fences or foundations, subdividing the lots, and then staking off new lots in the public common as we expanded our city. It gave very specific duties for a city surveyor, including that the city surveyor had to place um, cedar or cypress stakes in the center of each street in line with the lots that had been established by our city plan. They had to report back to council on all encroachments on our public property. And they had to complete, um, keep a complete map of each tithing within the city and a record of all buildings in those tithings. Come on in, just find a seat. So with the establishment of that office, the city had to appoint their first surveyor, and that was Mr. John McKinnon. So he was um, appointed in June of 1799, elected as our first city surveyor. So John McKinnon was born in the Isle of Skye in Scotland around 1768. He immigrated to Georgia in the early 1790s, where he self set himself up as a draftsman in Savannah. You see here this notice that he published in the Georgia Gazette in 1793, announcing that he was available as a surveyor. And he quote, um, stated, he has for some time past carried on the business of drawing, plotting, et cetera, in a neat and accurate manner from rough, rough sketches only. So he's open and ready for business. Um, by 1795, he was receiving public survey work. In May, the governor of Georgia appointed him as surveyor for Chatham County, and McKinnon posted this notice announcing that, and, um, and that he was available to enlarge or diminish charts, maps, and plots. Once he, the city council appointed him in 1799, he continued to do work for the county, and he often um, simultaneously served as both city and county surveyor at the same time. 
between 1799 and 1825, he served the city as city surveyor, but not continuously. Sometimes he was appointed as city surveyor, and then they'd appoint somebody else, and it went back and forth um, between him and other su surveyors. Um, but he had an on-again, off-again relationship with the city until his death in 1825. This is um, one of the gems in our collections, and we have it laid out across the hall. He left behind, um, for us, a small body of work, but it's one very rich in detail. It provides important information regarding the early development of the city and the expansion of Savannah. We've got seats over here, some over there. Um, this is a township plan that was prepared by McKinnon in 1798 before he was actually appointed a city surveyor. It's one of the few known maps that depicts the garden and farm lots. So I'm not showing you the full map, but the city um, downtown is actually down here, and these are the garden lots and then the farm lots. So if anybody else has their phone, turn it off. So. McKinnon also um, showed on this map major roads leading out of town. So here you see Augusta Road, Louisville Road, you have Bull Street, then becoming White Bluff Road. So a lot of detail on a, what's a really a very little map. So make sure you check that out when you go across the hall. So definitely one of the most special pieces in our, all of our collections. This is another one of my favorites. This is um, the, an 1820 plan of Savannah. It survey the survey work of McKinnon, but it was engraved by C.C. Wright. It, the final work is a very detailed map, depicts numerous structures, um, but also uh, it's a very artistic and beautiful representation of the park-like quality of Savannah's historic district and the importance of trees to the city. You'll see, let me see if my little point out. Right up here is the City Exchange, which is where City Hall is now. And you'll see it's nestled amongst the trees along Bay Street. The squares are depicted um, by circles of trees, and there's a little public well in the center of each. He's also shown the fire of 1820 um, in the Burn District surrounding Ellis Square and City Market. So a lot of information that has been put into this map here. That is also across the hall for you guys to see. But the story I really wanted to tell you about McKinnon today is about mystery and murder. So he had a really great start in Savannah, but not such a great ending. In fact, it was really quite tragic. And it started in October of 1825 when John Dillon, who was Justice of the Peace, beat number one, died. So we had to fill this Justice of the Peace position. And in no November 5th at 10 a.m., polls opened at the Georgia Hotel to elect a new justice of the peace. And Roderick William McKinnon was elected in a close contest. Well, Roderick was John McKinnon's son. So John McKinnon, of course, was at the polls all day with his son. He celebrated at the Georgia Hotel's bar. And he left at about 7 p.m. from the hotel. People said he left in a drunken state, but happy at the success of his son. Well, he never made it home. By November 9th, so that's about four days later, local newspapers started covering, oops, started covering McKinnon's disappearance and also rumors of a murder. So you see in here, the newspaper says, various rumors and surmises of a most serious nature are in circulation. But they're not gonna repeat it because they're just rumors at this time. That same day on November 9th, city council in the, um, in the city exchange on this site held a special meeting. They passed a resolution requiring the mayor to issue a proclamation offering a reward for information. And the next day, the newspaper um, issued or published that reward of $500 for information in relation to the supposed murder leading to conviction. Um, the newspaper kept talking about McKinnon in terms like our old, our respectable citizen. They were looking for information about Mr. McKinnon. So that's on the 10th. On the 11th, they still, they have raised the reward. Citizens have subscribed additional money. The reward's now up to $900, which in today, that's about $20,000. Um, they're talking about it in terms like supposed murder. And the family is very anxious and distressed about what has happened to him. That same day, they ended up finding his body. He was found floating in the river among the steamboats, along the steamboat wharf. 
They perform a coroner's inquest that day, which includes an autopsy and questioning of, all the, of witnesses. And they finish that up all in one day. And the funeral is performed that evening from the McKinnon residence, which was in the South Common. There's, uh, the records are not very good. We actually have it in our cemetery's database, his burial date, but it doesn't show where he's buried. So he's likely buried in Colonial Park Cemetery because that was the cemetery we were using. Um, but the newspapers say he was buried with military honors with the Corps of the Chatham Artillery um, uh, doing the honors because he was one of their members. On the next day, on the 12th, they released the coroner's inquest and they say that he was deprived of life by violence, which I think is another way of saying homicide, and that his body was then thrown into the river. And the primary cause of death is two contusions to the head, one in the front, one in the back. And he also had additional a serious wound to his back between his shoulders, which was inflicted by a heavy instrument of uh, instrument or stone. And this newspaper article kind of jumped out to me. I like murder mysteries. I like those old Agatha Christie's. And it said, Mr. MK has been most foully murdered. And you know, I could just like say it in my head with a certain sort of voice. But this isn't funny, but um, you know, it just sort of jumped out to me. So then on November 14th, Robert Dillon and Daniel Campbell were arrested and put in jail. Um, based on evidence that was given during that coroner's inquest. And Dylan and Campbell had been at the Georgia Hotel during the um, election, during the polls when they were open, and they were opponents of Roderick McKinnon's, or they were, you know, sort of campaigning against McKinnon in that Justice of the Peace election. On the same day that they were arrested, McKinnon's obituary was finally published. It's very brief. You know, it mentioned that he's from Isle of Skye, um, that he had been in the country for 35 years. He was a respectable and useful citizen to the state of Georgia. And then it talks about how his virtues are embalmed in the affections of his afflicted widow and family. So jump ahead to January of 1826, and you have the trial of Robert Dillon, who was charged as the principal in the murder, and Daniel Campbell as the accessory. It's held here in Chatham County Superior Court, and a man named Jedediah Barstow is the principal witness. Barstow, on um, the stand, repeatedly contradicts himself, and his whole testimony is thrown out, and after just 20 minutes, the jury comes back. There's some chairs over there, sir. Um, comes back and they um, return a guilty of not um, a verdict of not guilty because they say there's a want of evidence. So that is January 17th. Well, on January 17th, that same day, Dylan and Campbell are rearrested and based on new evidence, new evidence given by Jedediah Barstow, the same man whose testimony was just thrown out. Jedediah Barstow said, confessed. He says he saw the body immediately after the murder and he assisted in throwing it in the river. He says he didn't come forward because he was um, afraid for his own life. So his behavior is attributed to insanity, drunkenness, a desire to avoid prosecution, and fear for, for his own life from Dylan and Campbell. So, um, all this is going on, and then there appears this um, adver or this notice in the two local newspapers the, um, that Roderick is resigning as Justice of the Peace. No explanation is given. He just thanks everybody for their votes. No longer consider me Justice of the Peace. One can just sort of guess, you know, all of this has been too much. Maybe he feels guilty. We really don't know why he's resigning. So he's no longer Justice of the Peace. Um, in February, they have a second trial. This time, they flip the principal and accessory roles. Campbell's tried as the principal and Dylan as the accessory. They don't say this is to avoid double jeopardy, but perhaps it is. Um, Barstow, again, is the principal witness. He testifies that he sees several people in a yard, possibly the Georgia Hotel Stable Yard, beating on McKinnon's body. He doesn't know if McKinnon's already dead at that point. He kind of comes upon them. Um, and Dylan and Campbell are in the group, but he doesn't know who everybody else is. 
Um, he admits to assisting Campbell and Dillon to dispose of the body in the river. He contradicts his testimony while he's giving it several times. Um, and other people testify and contradict him as well. So the jury deliberates for just a few minutes again, and they return a verdict of not guilty. So two trials, two acquittals. Um, and that's the end of um, Dylan and Campbell being considered in the murder. In September of that year, Robert Dillon, who had left Savannah after the second trial and went to New York, died. The local Savannah paper um, reported that prior to his death, he confessed to involvement in the murder. But then there was a rebuttal the week later from an anonymous person saying, don't do that. that he did not confess. You're just ruining his good name and hurting his family. So it remains an unsolved mystery. We don't know exactly what happened after um, McKinnon left the hotel. We don't know how this fight started. We don't know all the parties involved. And we don't know Dylan Campbell or Barstow's um, true involvement. So, but we do know McKinnon was a very talented surveyor. So now I'm gonna move on to my second story. This is John B. Hogg. And he was first appointed 30 years after McKinnon died in 1855 as city surveyor. During the early part of his career, he was considered more of an architect than a surveyor. And he was listed in the city directories in 1849 and 1850 as an architect. <clears throat> Hogg had been a pupil of the celebrated architect Thomas Eustick Walter. He was a Pennsylvania architect who trained under William Strickland. And you see Walter here on the left. Um, Walter came to national attention in 1832 for his design of Girard College for Orphans in Philadelphia on the right. He's con and that building is considered one of the last and grandest expressions of Greek revival architecture. Um, he's also, after he worked with Hogg, he went on to become the fourth architect of the Capitol. And he's responsible for the designs of the north and south wings and the famous dome that we're also familiar with. So Hogg trained with Walter. In Savannah, our Hogg um, architectural commissions included Greek Revival Trinity Methodist, I'm sorry, the Greek Revival Trinity Methodist Church on Telfair uh, Square, whose cornerstone was laid in 1848. Um, Hogg, probably drew inspiration from Walter's First Presbyterian Church, which is in Westchester, Pennsylvania, very similar, and may have also been inspired by the publication The Young Carpenter's Assistant, which was published in 1837. And if you just, my little pointer, if you just kind of imagine it without the cupola, they're also very similar. He reused that design with some alterations for First Bryan Baptist Church in Yamacraw. Hogg provided the congregation the architectural drawings for free in 1873, and the members of the congregation built this church um, themselves. It took them about over 10 years to finish, um, so, um, but this is also a Hogg design. Um, Hogg's plan for a Forsyth Place was modified from the one that was prepared, prepared by the Bavarian landscape designer, William Bischoff. And it, was, and it was Hogg's plan that was adopted by city council in 1851. And I don't know if a lot of people know Hogg's involvement with Forsyth Place, which we now call Forsyth Park. But Forsyth Place is the northern part of Forsyth Park where the fountain is the centerpiece. And in 1855, city council adopted Hogg's plans for a new city market building that was going to be in Ellis Square. They didn't pursue it because they lacked funding. He prepared a new set of plans for a new market in 1869. This time it was going to have a city hall attached to it. But again, they dropped the plans for lack of uh, funding, and they went with a different architect in the 1870s for the city market we're all familiar with. But we easily could have been um, sitting in a different city hall designed by Hogg if they had gone with the 1869 plans. So, but the story I want to tell you about Hogg is entirely different. I wanted to let you know he was an architect, but in 1879, John B. Hogg changed his name to John B. Howard. 
Um, our collections document this change, including all surveys and drawings by him after 1879 are now signed by John B. Howard. City Council appointed him as John B. Howard. He took the office, oath of office under the name John B. Howard. And it just has always been this little mystery, like why would you change your name? There has you know, have to have a really good reason for that. And then in 1906, John W. Howard became city engineer, which we went from being city surveyors to engineers in 1890. And for years we wondered if there was a connection between, between John B. Howard and John W. Howard. So that was another question we've had. And I decided for your program I needed to figure this out. So it took a lot of digging and just the right source to figure it out. So here you see his signature changing from John B. Hogg to John B. Howard. And then this is one of the maps we have where he copied his own map. And in his copy, he showed, well, I made this map as John B. Hogg in 1866, and here's my copy, and I'm John B. Howard now. So I think it's pretty funny that even he's like having to copy his own work um, and show how he's changed his name. But in 1879, John B. Hogg, his wife Georgia, and all their living children applied to the Chatham County Superior Court to change their name to Howard, including their youngest son, John W. Hogg. They stated that their desire, they desired to change for reasons entirely personal and that they wanted their name to correspond with a large number of their relatives who had already changed their names. Their application was granted, and from that point forward, they ceased to be hogs and became Howards. We thought that was the end of the road for our research, that for that. We thought that changed his name. So I moved on to the next question. Um, was his son, who is now John W. Howard, our city engineer? So we looked at directories and census records, and what we saw was there were two John W. Howards in Savannah at the same time. And looking at occupations and ages and where they lived, I was leaning towards Hogg's son not being our engineer. Um, and I knew his son's name was Winda, middle name. So then I lucked out and I found our city engineer's obit. He died in 1945 and it stated his middle name was Webb. So I thought, oh, we're all good, right? Also said he, died, he was from Granville, South Carolina. Well, Hogg was from Hogg's Neck, South Carolina. So I thought, okay, everything's confirmed, right? <laughs> two different John W. Howards were from two different places, not related, book closed, no. Okay, so I was just curious about a hog's neck, right? I just wanted to know where hog's neck was. So, and didn't care about Granville. So I, look, I did a search for hog's neck and I came up with this family history. And I was like, cool, this is cool. And it took me a really long time to notice, I'm looking at this name, John. John Webb Howard, that's not my John Wyndham, that's not Hogg's son, that's our city engineer, right? This one document gave me all the answers. Our city engineer comes from the Hogg Howard family, okay? So this has all the answers. It goes all the way back to the original Hogg generation that came to the United States and immigrated and settled Hogg's Neck, South Carolina. So here's the story, George Hogg, came, settled Hogg's Neck. He then had James B. Hogg, who had James Hogg Jr. James Hogg Jr., for some unknown reason to the family, changes his name to James Hogg Howard in 1798. Right before he changes his name, he has James E. Hogg. He does not change all of the kids' names prior to his name change to James E. Hogg, I mean to Howard. They retain the Hogg name. Everybody born after he changes his name becomes Howard's. So what happens is he has two line, family lines. One are Hogg's, one are Howard's. So you have these two half brothers, Hogg and Howard. Then, um, so the Hogg family comes down and they're Hogg's. <clears throat> so Jane B. Hogg, John B. Hogg, this is our city surveyor. Um, he's a hog all his life, has all, the whole bunch of kids named Hog, but he decides in 1879 to change his name to match all of these people over here who are Howards. But he changes his kids with him. He doesn't leave them behind. Meanwhile, he's got a first cousin named Thomas Hayward Howard, right? His son is John Wyndham Howard. And then over here you have John Webb Howard, who goes by Guy, and that's our city engineer 
who um, becomes engineer in 1906, and they're second cousins. So that took way more research than it should have for what ended up being pretty easy. Um, let me jump forward. So our, um, our city surveyor and our city engineer are first cousins once removed. And here they are, John Hogg Howard and John Webb Howard, who goes by Guy. And John W. Howard, or Guy, as he went by, when he wrote his family history, um, he talked about how he came to be in the Savannah City Surveyor's Office. So I'm going to read you a quote. The compiler of this record came from Porter's <coughs> Military Academy in Charleston, South Carolina, to Savannah, April 1886 to work in the office of John B. Hogg Howard and lived with his family, Southwest Barnard and Walberg Streets, until his death, March 24th, 1888. Cousin John, as our family called him, held the office of city surveyor for many years. With his soft, congenial manners, friendly spirit, and Christian character, was loved by everyone in Savannah, and so was his large family. Our families were very intimate and exchanged many visits to Granville. He made annual visits to White Hall, the place on Hogg's Neck that he inherited from his uncle, General John H. Howard, accompanied by my father, who was his best friend. So, unlike McKinnon, we solved this little mystery. So, and Ferris knows that we've been trying to figure this out for a few years now um, about how they're related. All right, so um, now I'm going to jump into. Thank you. <laughs> um, now I'm going to jump into using the archives, but we are I almost. Might mention the manhole covers that are. Yeah, yeah. If you're ever walking around around Savannah and, and you like to look down, which you should look down, there's really cool stuff in our ground. We have several manhole covers that say John um, B. Hawk, City Surveyor. So, um, and there's all sorts of really cool things that are um, in our pavement, in our ground, as you leave the. Um, leave City Hall in the rotunda. We have the Chinese Ballastone that also is in the pavement of River Street. So all sorts of really cool things that are interwoven into our fabric. And that's, that's a good example of one. So um, we're almost to the halfway point. I'm going to run route really through quickly how to discover our collections and use um, and discover the maps on our website. But for those of you who are anxious to go look at the materials, you can also skip across the hall if you'd like to do that. So um, just to give you a little introduction to our collections, um, the Municipal um, Archives and Records Management Division, we collect, manage, preserve, and make accessible the records that document the City of Savannah government's history. We also administer the records management program from our, for our departments today. So we assist them in making sure that we have the records uh, the historical records for the future generations. And then um, because we have all these records, we share that history those records contain with our citizens and visitors and employees through outreach activities like this. Um, <clears throat> overall, our collections sort of, um, you know, these sort of, some of the parameters of them, city government was established in 1789. So for the most part, our collections are gonna date after that point. They are also going to reflect what our corporate limits are. So if you're looking for um, records from 1800 for South Side, we're not going to have that because we didn't annex the South Side until into the, tw into the 1900s. So you have to think about what our corporate limits were during a given point in time. And you also have to think about what our city government functions are. So our records are going to reflect what we do. So what does the state government do versus the county government versus city government? For our engineering collections, we have things like maps, surveys, and plats, architectural plans and drawings. And let me caveat that by saying most of our architectural collections reflect city buildings that we have built or owned or modified. So we don't really hold architectural drawings for your private um, homes and properties. But we can know where to direct you to other repositories that might. Um, we also have administrative records for our surveyor and engineer offices, things like correspondence and financial, field notebooks, annual reports. 
how do you use the collections? Well, we have a very small staff. It's Kelly and I are the only permanent archivists on staff, and then we have some project staff um, and grant staff. So we have tried to put as much information as possible on our website, and um, savannahga.gov slash municipal archives is your starting point, and you would go to using the archives. And we have put several different tools online for you. All of our finding aids, which are our collection guides and our inventories are on the Explore the Collections page. And I'm gonna show you snapshots. We have research guides, which are subject-based lists. And then you can also reach us through ask a question or schedule an appointment. There's information about preparing for a visit. And we've linked to our digital collections. So here are some snapshots for you. Um, when you get to the Using the Archives page, you can see up here are the links to explore the collections, the guides, and the, cl and the digital collections. If you scroll down, you'll get down here, you can see <laughs> tips for preparing for a visit. Up here is how you link to the email for the archivist. When you go to the Explore the Collections page, it's a big long list. This is just uh, some snapshots of our collections for the public. Um, it's alphabetical, so you can jump down. Um, like if you click like, I know I want engineering, you could jump down to E and get a list of the collections for engineering. Each of these entries has the collection title, which is hyperlinked to a finding aid or inventory. The dates it covers, like this one for the general maps, covers 1752 to 1971. It has over a thousand items in it and it's part of the larger engine engineering department records. And then if anything's been digitized, it'll link you directly to the materials that have been digitized. I will tell you, none of our collections have been digitized in whole. We try, when we do digitize, we'll digitize a selection to give you an idea of what we have, but don't assume everything's been digitized. Then the finding aids, these are the tools that tell you what we have. So when you go in, a finding aid will look something like this. It'll tell you a description, like this is what this collection has, how it's ordered, and then it'll give you some kind of inventory. Most of our map collection inventories look like this, where it has a map number, a description, a date if it has it, a surveyor if we know who did it, um, and then you know location information for us. So if you identify something you wanna see, you need at a minimum to give us the number so we can pull it for you, okay? If you have trouble using the finding aids, the research guides are a good place to go. This is the list of all the different types of guides. If you're looking for information on a specific piece of property or building, the building list is a really good one. If you're looking for information on a specific person or family, the genealogy is a good one. We created a special one for today, which I printed out across the hall called the Engineering and Public Works list, and this is it here. They tell you about certain collections that are useful for the type of research you're doing, and then it has hyperlinks directly into the finding aids we're talking about. So you don't have to go through that explore the collections list. And then this is the digital collections page, and it's a pretty long page, so these are some snapshots, but we have partnered with a couple of different portals to deliver digital material. Um, we have a digital image catalog, which we host, where we have shared photographs and postcards. We've partnered with Ancestry to share materials that are useful for genealogy. We partnered with the Digital Library of Georgia on a couple of different things, including the map collections. Um, they also have the annual reports, which are really useful from an engineering and surveying perspective, because the engineer would give really detailed reports of their work. And we also have city codes, which are good. I highlighted the ones which I thought were good for you guys for survey stuff. Um, and then I wanted to give you a snapshot of Digital Library of Georgia. So this is what just launched this summer with the maps. So again, it was about 466 maps. Let me go back for a minute. They did it from three different of our map collections. I think we have about five or six map collections. They did selections from general maps, the cadastral survey ward maps, and our subdivision maps. And when you click on those links, they have collection pages. And this is what a collection page looks like. Um, you can do a keyword search within a collection page. This will tell you what collection you're in. Um, you can do a refined search within the collection page. It'll pull up a thumbnail. And then if you click on the thumbnail, it'll open up the high res image. 
if you click on the link under the thumbnail, it'll pull up the actual item details. If you're interested in exploring other collections, you go up to the Explore button up here, so you can, um, and it'll do a drop-down menu. It'll say, do you want to explore items, collections, counties, institutions? It'll say maps. They're actually saying, do you want to explore by geography? So it'll pull up a map of like the state, and you can click on, I want to explore this area of Georgia, okay? So if I were to click on one of these thumbnails or these links, this is what you're going to get. You'll get a big map, a high-res PDF, or you're going to get this informational page, which then has links that'll take you to things like that. But it'll give you like the citation. So if you wanted to come in and look at the original, you're going to give Kelly or I the citation so we can pull out the original for you. Does this collection represent all of your uh, maps of that type? No. Again, it's just a sample. Okay. So for instance, I'm that one, I think I was looking at the general maps. Um, when we were looking at the finding it, it said it had over 1,000 maps in that collection. We only have 400 total digitized over all three collections. Are we all, have- Are all 400 on, online there? There's 400 maps Digital Library of Georgia did from three of our collections. We have somewhere between 4,500 and 5,000 map surveys and plots total in our collections. Okay, thank you. So yeah. All right. So, I'm done here. So what I'm going to suggest is we, you move on over there and I can answer any additional questions. We've got a whole bunch of stuff spread out. We've got all the handouts I mentioned. And um, there's also a computer station set up over there so you can play around with the finding aids and the Digital Library of Georgia as well. So council chamber across the hall. And we are in no rush. So you can take as much time over there as you want. Thank you. It's really important that we maintain our historical records so that we see what all the work that we have done over time, everything that the citizens have contributed to and paid for, and we have a record of how what the city government has done for uh, the public and how we've grown and changed, and also so that we can study it and learn from it and move forward through time. So the archives are really, they are the record of the city of Savannah and city government. The collection dates back to 1798 and the city's very first surveyor, John McKinnon. Maps and plats show how the city has expanded and developed over the years. It also includes plans and drawings for many of the city's historic buildings. Things like Savannah City Hall, the old municipal auditorium, um, some of our Savannah um, police departments and fire stations. So some of those landmark buildings that the city's um, built over time. There's one particular favorite that's a, a real historical gem in our collection. It's one of the earliest items we have. It's from 1798, and it was um, prepared by our very first city surveyor, John McKinnon, who was appointed in 1799. It's very tiny. It's only about eight inches by 10 inches large. It's showing the garden and farm lots of Savannah, the town, the historic district is actually not even depicted on this map. While other items in the collection never materialized, Spracker says that they can still be appreciated for their artistic quality and attention to detail. Many of them are colorized. Um, um, they have colored pen and pencil and watercolor, makes them very beautiful. The, they are very artistic in the nature of the drawing. Um, and so they're very beautiful to look at. We recently worked with the Digital Library of Georgia to digitize over 500 of these maps and drawings. So you can access some of the collection online, but we really love it when the public comes in and uses our collection here in City Hall as well. To access the collection online, visit www.savannahga.gov and click on the Digital Archives link. You can also visit the city's research library and municipal archives located on the first floor of City Hall. For more information, call 651-6412.